Okay, well, we've sent out search parties to search for the Vice-Chancellor. Um, we assume that he's been kidnapped somewhere en route from the Abbey to uh, the Faraday building. Um, there will be a rescue mission later, which you're all uh, welcome to join in. Um, and I'm sure uh, he will turn up somewhere at some point. So I'm going to pretend to be the Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> a role that I've always wanted to play. Um, I did actually write this, so uh, it may be easier for me to introduce Vanessa than it would have been for uh, uh, the VC. It's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker for the third annual Mike Barnsley lecture, and to welcome Linwin, John and Beryl Barnsley back to the university for this annual event. The Mike Barnsley lecture celebrates Mike's life and his enormous contributions to the university and to science. And it's to remind us all as well what a fantastic friend and an inspirational colleague he was to us all. For this year's lecture, we have the honour of welcoming Dr Vanessa Lawrence, um, who is the Director General and the Chief Executive of the Ordnance Survey. Uh, in choosing Vanessa to present this lecture, we had the real pleasure to be able to combine somebody who knew Mike personally um, and also works in GIS which, of course, is one of the uh, areas which Mike himself worked in. Mike was the Professor of GIS and Remote Sensing in the Department of Geography uh, here at Swansea. So, Vanessa Lawrence, our speaker tonight, is a world-renowned expert in G how GIS can improve decision-making uh, at all levels of government and business. Vanessa is advisor to the British government on short and medium strategies for mapping, surveying and geographic um, information. She has been awarded the most amazing list of honours and uh, accolades, and I'm not going to list them all tonight, which, uh, because it would take far too long, and we've already used up quite a lot of time. But uh, I would like to mention she's the Honorary Vice President of the Geographical Association and uh, a member of council for the Royal Geographical Society. She has many honorary degrees and honorary fellowships. She's also patron of a charity, Map Action, which is a charity that uh, one of my ex-postdocs um, now works for, um, who is at British Antarctic Survey. So it's a charity I know a little bit about and does some really good things. Um, she's also awarded in January 2011, Geospatial Personality of the Decade, <laughs> recognizing the contribution that she'd made over the previous 10 years. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to Vanessa Lawrence to tell us about mapping, underpinning the world's decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavy. Let me just check if I turn the microphone back on. Oh, is that off? No, that's off. That's off. Okay, fantastic. Earlier it was recording everything I was saying. Let's put it down there. Mr. Microphone, are you happy with that? Sorry. He wants to record it. <laughs> Sorry? You need a bit more light. Okay. Well, while Tavy's sorting out the lights, can I say for me what a privilege, a personal privilege, this is to be here? I um, was incredibly fortunate to know Mike Barnsley extremely well. He was two years younger than me, and for those of you who perhaps are in uh, doctoral positions or postdocs, you'll know how, what a great working relationship you have with other people who are working in the same field as you. And uh, basically, I used to be highly involved in remote sensing and the spectral part of vegetation analysis. And of course, Mike was one of the gurus. And we also were linked in the fact that when he was at Reading University, uh, his first tutor was a man called Professor Paul Curran. And uh, basically, my tutor was Professor Paul Curran. And uh, what also, a man I thought was just 
amazing was Professor John Townsend, and he was Mike's supervisor of his PhD. So there were so many things that linked Mike and I, but in fact, I've also found another one today, which I didn't know, was that Mike actually, uh, later on when I was obviously doing other things in my career, and he was doing other things in his career, he actually was uh, part of the Ordnance Survey Science and Technology Advisory Group, which used to give the then Director General advice on how technology would change the landscape of things. So as Director General now, I think it's in immensely wonderful that I've been invited to speak today. Um, and uh, very much, he was somebody who I was uh, mentioning to uh, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Barnsley, who made a difference to my early career in lots of ways, both personally and professionally. So it's a huge honour to do this lecture today. Anyway, have we still got our hour, Tavy? Is that okay? Everyone buy into an hour, but don't, uh, you know, don't exceed it because I'm hungry, you know. <laughs> Okay, we'll buy into an hour, and uh, I'm sorry that um, the Vice-Chancellor could have got to know more about mapping and GIS, the exciting things like this. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, I'm hoping over the next 40 minutes to give you an insight into how I think mapping is underpinning the world's decision-making. I'm really, really, really happy to take questions after then of any nature. You know, we're a mixed audience. Some of you may be people who uh, are, you know, thinking about careers. Some of you may be just thinking, should I do this mapping stuff? Or some of you may just be here because you love Ordnance Survey paper maps. So, you know, any question I'm open and up for, okay? So, some of these things you may be completely aware of. But for some people, you may not have thought that geography underpins every part of your daily life whether it be receiving your online shopping at home, whether it's about receiving uh, your utilities, your mobile phone cells, the fact the emergency services actually find your house. It's all to do with geography. And geography very much underpins so much of the decision-making of Great Britain. Now, I can see some people taking notes. I'm really happy to take notes, but I can also leave a PDF of this, of this uh, presentation, Tavy, if you would want it for geography students or whatever, just so that people don't have to spend... I used to spend my whole time copying down other people's slides and think, ah, uh, oh, you know, I wish they would leave the slides, so let me tell you that up front. What I see also is geography has gone mobile. And um, what we're seeing is professional users, like uh, if you see BT Open Reach, you see one of those white vans, you'll be guaranteed they're using on a mobile device ordnance survey information that is uh, assisting them with uh, reconnecting transmission, basically. But of course, we also know geography's gone mobile in the many, many applications that we all have on our devices. And, of course, we've also seen how challenging it can be when you don't get your mapping right. And, of course, uh, Apple has uh, had this uh, in a rather momentous way in the last three weeks. But something that I'm very aware of is how to communicate that geography really does make a difference to people's lives. And one of the phrases that I found attracts a lot of people and they understand it, and they may not come from our background at all, is the phrase that everything happens somewhere. So place and locality are vital ingredients of every decision. And along with revenue, time and cost, one is often finding place or location being uh, a key part of the decision making of individuals, of organisations, of um, regional governments, and of national governments. And uh, I know there are some human geographers in the audience tonight, and um, very much the power of place and the power of different places, whether, as at the top of the screen, you're looking at uh, a street in uh, Spain, 
or whether you're looking at Shanghai, it's all about place and what is going on within those places. I have the privilege in the last few days to do some advising on Hurricane Sandy to uh, some of the Caribbean countries. And, you know, the power of place there, wow. You know, obviously uh, there is so much going on when you're facing that kind of event and you're thinking about how am I going to manage what's going to happen in the next few hours? And also, how am I going to manage the rescue if the map is completely obliterated? Um, things that are faced and have been faced in, obviously, Haiti, um, it's faced in several African countries each year and has to be thought through. I was fortunate enough to uh, basically give a major speech at the Rio Plus 20 conference, which you may recall was uh, quite highly publicized, some positive, some negative. I kept away from the politics. Um, I was there very much at the invitation of the United Nations to talk about the economic benefit of locality information. And what very clearly people realize is that it underpinned so many of the things they were talking about in the more political sense, sustainability, food management, sustainable agriculture, and water management. And what I found there was people hadn't really thought about that place and locality issues, but once they had it kind of expressed to them in ways that brought back to their daily lives, they started to realize. You know, but then there is such need in the world. I was lucky enough to sit next to the head of climate change for Bangladesh. My goodness, what a big job he's got. Um, and, you know, how poorly the information agenda is supporting some of his decisions. And it's about what can we all do. The good thing is that in the document, which I know has had mixed views uh, on it, but as I said, I was not involved in any of that and kept very much away from it. I was though pleased to have managed to get the words reliable geospatial information into two places because this makes a difference because if in such a document these things are stated, it means that countries have to get on with it. And so if you haven't got reliable geospatial information, then you are going to have to actually do something about it to solve your problems and to assist our colleague from Bangladesh. What was also pleasing was to see that our top of our government got it. Nick Clegg was the most senior person to uh, be out there from the United Kingdom. He had a five minute speech. Uh, they all leaders had five minute speech, except for one leader from Iran who decided he would have a 45 minute speech and nobody seemed to uh, get rid of him off the stage. But um, uh, Mrs. Clinton followed um, Nick Clegg and uh, I was involved in how those two teams got words and spaces into those speeches, which was quite interesting um, because, uh, you know, they only have five minutes and they only have five minutes worth of punchy lines. So the interesting thing was to see that Nick Clegg decided that reliable, trusted geographic information was important enough to put into his speech. What we see is other nations taking geography rather seriously. Um, these slides have been provided to me by Professor Lee, who is my opposite number in China. Uh, he uh, runs the State Bureau of Survey and Mapping, a much larger organization than Ordnance Survey, I hasten to add. Um, but also many students, Chinese students who study here in Britain, go back to work for him. And uh, I was recently a guest, uh, as a guest of the Vice Premier of China, and spent 10 days working with Professor Li. And um, many people kept popping up and telling me that I'd been the external examiner on the UCL course, or I'd been this, and they were, they'd studied at various universities, so that was great. 
But in China, they have these five-year plans. And they have a five-year plan that absolutely talks about geographical information. And certainly talking to the, the, the senior leaders, I think would be a better way of putting it, in China, they saw geographic information as an economic growth uh, indicator for their country. Because they very clearly say, if they have digital China, together with geospatial monitoring and the geospatial information industry, then they'll be a leading country. And uh, these, uh, you know, this is their, very much their statement. And what is clear is it's not just about the nation, it's right down to the digital township. And it's understanding how you organize that information framework um, in an effective manner so that you really can understand the power of place and the power of location and make decisions on it. And what they're doing is building a very effective geospatial industry that's already larger than anything that we see in, uh, in the rest of the world. Um, and uh, what, we, uh, what, what we very clearly are seeing is, um, you know, total output was, I think that's, I worked it out last week, I think that's 25 billion US dollars. Um, that's much larger than anywhere else in the world. Um, but they also are building a lot of companies. And interestingly, they're building this geospatial estates. And they're building eight of them at the moment. They're investing 1.8 billion dollars into each and if you fly into um, uh, into Beijing airport that is the view that actually greets you now and if you look over to one side of the plane you actually see the geospatial park and it's housing their licensed enterprises and also the National Mapping Agency but huge growth in this area but we're seeing in other countries the use of geospatial at times of strife. Here in Australia in January 2011, you'll remember the dreadful floods. Now, interestingly in Australia, they have some very interesting legislation that says if the water comes to a certain height in a house, the government will compensate you. And that's, uh, that's fine. The only problem they had though was that, of course, you know, that kind of legislation works when you've got 25 houses being flooded because you can send around a surveyor who measures it, who says, oh yes, that's fine. But when you have tens of thousands of houses flooded, you have a population that is just needs help. You've got to work out who you're going to compensate pretty quickly. So using, uh, I thought, fantastic complete innovative way of doing things, the, uh, all the remote sensing teams and GIS teams got together, worked out where the debris lines were from aerial imagery and also from satellite photography. And then they published on the web within 24 hours of the flood, flood lines. And if you were within a flood line, then you got automatic compensation. You didn't even have to fill the form in. All you had to do was send your address in. And if you were outside the flood lines but still wanted compensation, then absolutely a surveyor would come round. And this made a huge difference to how the population viewed their politicians, their decision makers. They were quickly making those decisions and illustrating them and making a, a difference in what were major geographies of the nation all down the kind of Queensland coast, including Brisbane. It's interesting, certain governments decide that the spatial capability of their country needs to be looked at. And um, this is in order to make enhanced decisions, in order to have a national framework, because there's lots of country that do not have national mapping agencies. And one such country that I was lucky enough to go and do a report on last year was Australia. And the report is freely available on the web. But what clearly it showed was that they have very effective state mapping. But then moving up to a larger scale where you can actually see buildings and do things in a, in a better way, 
they did not have that data. And so much of the analysis and decision making that we take for norm here in Britain, um, being able to deploy assets quickly to an area, knowing a lot about that area from the mapping was not possible. And so uh, they then took my recommendations and wrote their own um, kind of response to it, and they're getting on with the implementing of that. What we see in Hong Kong, the, probably the most detailed mapping in the world, but they're moving from 2D mapping to 3D. And 3D is the future. Um, I advise in the Middle East on behalf of the British government quite a lot, and most of the countries there did not have 2D mapping, so they're going straight to 3D mapping. We in Ordnance Survey are looking at how we should loft our data so the country has 3D, but not probably universally, but you certainly want it in the top 40 conurbations in, uh, in Great Britain fairly quickly. And what we're seeing is many, many ways to create these digital cities across the world. Turning now, though, to you know, making a difference to people. I have been lucky enough to be vaguely involved with this, and this has been supported by the British government. Because land theft and people just moving in on other people's land, land security, creates massive conflict. And in some countries, conflict rises to very extreme ways of dealing with these conflicts. Often people die. And in Rwanda, many of us will remember the atrocities in Rwanda, one of the things was to try and increase the land registration plots. Because the reason land registration is so important to a country is that as soon as you have a registered plot registered to you, then you have an asset against which you can get a loan. It might be a loan to have some seed, it might be a loan to buy some animals, or it may be a loan to build a building. But until you have that ownership, the economy of a country is certainly impaired. So basically what has happened was that it was decided in Rwanda it was impossible for the authorities to go and do all the mapping that was needed in the speed that was required. And so handheld GPSs were given to the population for them to go and delineate their boundaries. And then people to be able to look, put it, send the data in and be able to look at where were their real conflicts and deal just with the conflict zones. And as a result, basically uh, in 2009 there were only 40,000 uh, registered plots and there will be 6.9 million by 2015, giving people a clear ability to now raise money against these things. You'll see on the weekend, Abu Dhabi, it's the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. And just near Yaz Island, which is where uh, all everything will happen this weekend, is Mazda City. And Mazda City is the first carbon neutral city in the world. And what they've done is they've used GIS in every aspect of every part of decision making. Making sure it's used in the construction process, making sure that it's used in all the planning of the transport and the energy networks, making sure that all the buildings are monitored effectively to ensure they have sort of zero carbon and making sure that sort of the social development is working. It's quite interesting how this, they, because they can, they're building a city out of the sand fairly quickly, they're able to build it in this kind of particular way uh, using geography as a base. And then another, um, when I was in Rio, I was pretty horrified by the rainstorms. Now, uh, you can imagine, I've heard I'm going to Rio, I've seen the pictures, I'll tell you, it rained for five solid days and I was only there for five days. And there was one thing that uh, was notable, was the mass flooding in the streets, which led to mass traffic management problems and everything. So I thought that I should try and find out a little bit more about how is this managed, because what I became acutely aware was it was being managed quite well. And what they have is, because they understand the runoff problems, etc., 
they actually have an operations centre that's absolutely monitoring with CCTV, geography, deployment of people to free up areas very, very quickly as soon as rain events have come through. And uh, it's all based on good GIS. And then finally, uh, another thing that uh, always concerns me is water theft. In a lot of African countries where I have uh, uh, privilege to sometimes go, basically trying to get good water management is absolutely key. But it's about understanding what is the water resource they have, understanding water flows, um, understanding how those resources should be managed effectively. And basically it's good geography that requires that. So basically um, there have been quite a lot of statements made around the world about the need for better geographical information. And the UN has lots of different ways of managing things. They have lots of unofficial ways where if a group of member states get together, four or five, and they want to run something under the UN badge, they can. But they have very, very few formal mechanisms except through the Defence and Security Council and through the Economic and Social Council, which go into the UN General Assembly. And basically, um, what has been, was noticeable in the last two years was the UN have been making some pretty big and bold statements, such as there's a significant gap in the management of geospatial information globally. And what they did, they decided to set up a part of the formal mechanism of the UN in order to ensure that global geospatial information management going forward would be better managed within countries. And um, what does this really mean? Basically, here you can uh, see there's the Secretary General and uh, what you uh, uh, can see, there's the Economic and Social Council and they have now formally put it as part of the formal part of the UN. Now what's the advantage for countries? The advantage is that it allows anyone in that mechanism, well it not only allows them, it uh, absolutely makes them have to report back to all the UN missions that are dotted throughout New York. Because you may not be aware, but every country of the United Nations, however small, has got an office in New York with an ambassador in it. So in New York you have often the UN, um, uh, you have the, the uh, ambassador to the United States from your country, but you also have the UN ambassador and they always have those, those two. And what this now means is countries are hearing officially from the UN that they have to have reliable, trusted geographical information that's maintained and ethically corrected. And this committee has been set up um, and the vision is to make it uh, across the world basically within this decade. And it is making a, a difference. Uh, I can talk a little bit about it. Basically, it was first started in October 2011. And as a little bit of an aside, I did not know what was going to happen to me. Um, you know, I'm proud to be the Director General of Ordnance Survey, and I work for the British government. What I found was an official person from the UN came to see me in Southampton, which I thought was a bit surprising, not being rude. You know, people don't normally get as far as Southampton. They might ask me for a meeting in London, but, you know, Southampton with a delegation. Anyway, this guy turned up, and when I worked out that he worked for the Secretary General, I thought, crikey. Anyway, during the conversation, he told me about how important this was going to be and how it's going to make a difference, and I said, fine. He then said, um, it's been decided, which is a very UN phrase, that you will be the first co-chair of this committee. So I immediately said, I'm sorry, I couldn't possibly uh, agree to that. You know, I work to ministers and we'll see what they say. Anyway, he pulled, he's quite a cool guy, he pulls a piece of paper out of his um, jacket and said, let me just look down. I've got 97 countries who have already agreed, the United Kingdom's already agreed. 
So I found myself suddenly into a new position in life of having to try and lead uh, about the 142 countries who have decided to show an interest in this. And one of the first things I did was chairing Korea in the Republic of Korea, a um, ministers, set of ministers, which was probably the biggest management challenge I've ever had. Um, as you can imagine, every minister has behind them an ambassador who's very worried that the minister might be embarrassed. And then you've also got um, they've got lots of officials who are worried that the minister might get caught out and they've all got this chair from Britain who they're not sure about. So anyway, the good thing was it went very smoothly. But um, uh, basically what then happened was some very big statements have been said. Just like statistics, every country must have authority, trusted, maintained and definitive mapping data. So along with good governance and adequate financial system, the UN has always said that you have to have good statistics that are ethically corrected, and now they say you must have definitive mapping data. So this has continued along um, and is an important differentiator and brings together all the major kind of decision makers of mapping, hence my good relations with my Chinese colleagues um, and uh, a sharing of trying to get many countries who still lack this kind of framework to have this framework. And a lot of investment is going into that. But something that might be useful to you if you're studying anything, any topic, is that there's been a document that you can, you know, obviously not plagiarize, because that's not what students do, but uh, you can take any of the ideas you like. Because the good thing is that it belongs to you, because you're a citizen of a country whatever country you're from, that is probably a member of the UN. And basically, it's a document that I have worked uh, on. Basically, people said they want to know where this is going in the next five to ten years. Now, some of us in the audience know some of the big visionaries, but do they really have the vision to go and tell me exactly what's going to happen in everything from collecting data to the laws of how geospatial is going to be affected, to the trends in technology. There is no single person I know in the world who can do that. So what happened was I sort of crowdsourced it, really. Um, I formed a small team of heads of national mapping from around the world. We came up with names of over 100 experts. And the nice thing was that I wrote out to them all and 87 of them did exactly what they were asked to do, which was to provide me with 1,500 words on how their particular bit might change over the next five to 10 years. And we basically made five broad themes of this, um, basically everything from trends in technology, legal and policy developments, skills requirements and training mechanisms, the role of the private sector and non-governmental sectors, and the role of governments in data provision and management. And just running through the trends in technology, just one section of it, and if the university is kind of keen to have it, I can make sure I give you the links and I can give you the associated PowerPoint, um, which isn't authoritative because I did the PowerPoint, but you know, at least it's there. If you don't want to read the document, you've got the PowerPoint sort of thing. But um, basically, it's all about, in the future, so many parts of our lives will be a geospatial beacon. So many things, even around us today, if you kind of think about it on your way home, how many things are actually telling people about your location, whether you want them to or not, actually? And what we are going to see is that expand enormously. It's estimated that um, basically at the moment 2.5 quintillion bytes are created per day of data. And uh, there's big issues about the data management. And there's even more need for real-time, real-time uh, information, real-time modelling, and of course the role of social media is taking a major place. What we're also seeing is that, you know, it's estimated that even though, you know, we all know that there will be millions of people who will never have a gadget that is locationally uh, enabled. What we also know is the compensation 
is greater on the other side. And if we think that even in our homes, smart metering, which is definitely going to come under EU law, through to you know, the in added intelligence, whether we want it or not, that's going to be in new fridges and new uh, gadgets that we have around us, they're estimating that across the world, on average, nine gadgets per person will be locationally enabled. And you know, when you think of the interconnectivity of this, you're talking into 50 billion things being connected by 2020. Obviously, the cloud is very important going forward. And what we're seeing is um, there's massive shift in how things are being managed and hosted. And of course, open source is going to play a major part going forward. Um, and, you know, it's really driving a change across the public sector, the private sector, all kinds of business, etc. And what we're also seeing is future geospatial leaders are being exposed at an early age, and that's the way they're thinking, is open source. The trend will move from 2D very quickly, I think, to 3D and on to 4D visualizations. And um, what we're seeing is people really wanting to do complex and realistic models. What we're also seeing is the use of things like UAV, uh, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. This is ordnance surveys. And, um, you know, basically it helps us. We, uh, I'll talk a bit more about ordnance survey in a moment, but this is new to us, but it helps us, for instance, do coastal mapping, where it's too dangerous for us to map, ma help map railway lines, and also, if sadly there's a very big disaster, it's a quick way to get information uh, to the situational awareness people. We know that the quality of satellite information and aerial satellite data will continue to increase. And we also know that indoor positioning is now the future. There are many places across the world who have these massive shopping malls. And you know, the moment you walk in with your smartphone, it tells you, do you want, you know, it's feeding you stuff straight away. Do you want our plan? And it shows you where you're going to go around these massive shopping malls particularly if you're in places like Dubai and places like that. And what we're seeing is a complete challenging environments for data collection, massive amounts, and also a real push towards interoperability of the data. But you can find out about that as much as I can tell you about it, because it's all free to you to read this report and to study it or to have an exam question on it, if you chose. Um, because the view of the UN is end users should be able to consume government assured spatial data with the level of trust in quality as they do when they get water out of a tap. They also want to know what they're going to get and what they should expect. Now we all know that sadly there's a lot of the world that doesn't even have clean water. But, you know, there's a lot of work and I have to say a lot of money being given by some countries, not our country, uh, our country is taking strategic leadership, but, uh, uh, um, but there is other countries giving quite a lot of money towards this, particularly in the Middle East and Far East countries. So just a couple more topics before we finish. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Ordnance Survey. Um, I'm very proud of our site because uh, we managed to move last year and we built a purpose-built building for ourselves, which is um, when we built it, it was the greenest building in Great Britain. It has 90 pumps that go into the core of the earth to basically um, uh, draw up the heat. And so it's completely self-sustaining. But we're a pretty old organisation and um, we are a government department. I report directly to government ministers. And we have this um, business model where we don't receive any money from the taxpayer to uh, basically um, manage ordinance survey. We only receive money from government when they are a customer and they pay off a rate card, basically. And um, we've been growing it steadily over the number of years I've been leading it. Um, and our revenues are now uh, in excess of 140 million pounds. We uh, make a profit and we then give, the, give a dividend 
which um, last year was uh, £17.2 million off a profit of £31 million. Pounds. And this year, uh, the government's already told me I have to give them 60% of profits. So um, basically, we are a revenue provider to the country, not a drain on tax. Our job is to create and maintain the master map of Great Britain from which others derive benefit, and we make massive change to that each and every day. We say for audit purposes we make 5,000 changes per day, but for the last two and a half years we've actually been making over 10,000 changes per day. Just look around you, you know, when perhaps a petrol station's knocked down and new flats go up, or there's a road realignment, absolutely the Ordnance Survey is mapping that change. And we have certain targets where we have to get the real world change into the database within six months of change on the ground. And uh, last year we hit that target with 99.96% accuracy. We work with partners, and many of you will see the results of that, whether it be you've got an in-car navigation um, system, whether it be when you ring up for an insurance quote, or even when uh, uh, you're doing online shopping. Basically, quite often our data is embedded in the application that you are using, and Ordnance Survey receives a royalty depending on the performance of that company. It might be a, an outdoor leisure Garmin GPS type device, or many of the others. And this is really what we do, is we create this master map, where every feature is on the landscape, and we guarantee that it's within 40 centimetres of where we say it is on the master map of Great Britain. And uh, we survey to one centimetre accuracy, but the key thing is to make sure that we're collecting change. Now, there was a huge dispute sent to me today about this slide. Nobody wanted to give it to me, and eventually I demanded it and said, just hand it over, because the University of Swans is in the middle of a building programme, and it's, uh, somebody hasn't been round for the last three months, and they were most worried about it. And that's how Ordnance Survey, that's the wonderful staff we have, that they're so worried that I'll put up a slide that you'll say is out of date. So there we are. But um, anyway, that uh, is the reality. It's not just a picture, though. Every feature, the feature might be your front garden, your back garden, your house, is a living part of a database where there is a unique 16-digit code connected to it so that you are able to share that information between different authorities. So here's the highways database saying there's no lighting and a crime report database saying there's a vehicle break-in. We uh, basically have four effective uh, major sources of the master map from which other people then derive benefit and we also derive different scale information. There's our topography layer, for which we're famous for, going back nearly two, over 200 years. Then we have our address layer, which uh, we collect, we check over 50,000 addresses per month. Because in Britain, you are allowed to change your house name by just walking out and putting your house name out. There is no legislation that says you can't, and you'll be amazed at the number of people who do it, and I'd strongly advise you don't. Uh, <laughs> because then there is often confusion. You know, in one place in Yorkshire, uh, there are five white houses living on White Lane. Now, we can't tell them to change their address, but it'd be awfully helpful, because an emergency service vehicle cannot get there easily without, you know, an understanding. So, basically, um, the key job of Ordnance Survey is to keep that database up to date. And we do that with wonderful field surveyors, um, and we've got over 300 of those. Then wonderful uh, people who fly, one third of the country. And uh, basically, then we also analyze that information and basically make those changes. One of the other things we do is we are the people who correct the GPS signal so that it moves from 10 metres, which is what your mobile phone and other devices might be, and we basically create the correction signal to make it down to one centimetre accuracy. 
We started this because we've always been the geodetic experts, and for these, for people who perhaps are unfamiliar with that, it's all about understanding the curvature of the Earth and um, being able to uh, uh, analyse exactly where you are on the on the, a particular position. But we started this because we wanted to create some efficiencies in our surveying force. We used to have 650 surveyors and we had a car crash waiting to happen. Uh, there were over 400 of them, over 50. And we hadn't trained enough to uh, renew. So we needed to get the workforce sort of halved in number by the time they wanted to retire. So um, what we did was create these base stations around the country and you can see them quite easily. And uh, what, how it works is with a particular survey grade uh, GPS, you turn it on, you immediately see uh, satellites and within a third of a second, you get a correction from Ordnance Survey, correcting it down to one centimeter accuracy. And that's been used by people like the Highways Agency to basically open the roads. You might not think about it, but when there's sadly a fatal car crash, um, they have to take all their measurements very, very, very accurately. And here they're opening the roads 40 minutes quicker using this technology. Now we supply our data in lots of different ways, from paper, offline, online, right through to linked data. But our paper maps, which so many people know, is still something that absolutely we're passionate about at Ordnance Survey. There's still 7% of our trading revenue. We still sell 2.2 million a year, but 4.5 million people walk on them every weekend. And what we now have is a product called OS Custom Made, where you can go onto the website and have delivered to your house something that looks exactly like an Explorer map or a Land Ranger map, but it is um, basically, uh, it's site-centered on where you want it. It's perhaps uh, got Bob's favorite walks on it. You know, you've titled it up yourself, and there's also, you can, uh, as from next month, have your own picture as well. So it's for you, especially for Christmas. And we also have something, uh, we have a leisure portal where for 19.99 you can go on and print out A4 extracts and put your GPS logs on, on top. We're still working at this application. I'm not still happy with it, but it is out there. And Ordnance Survey will have an app by just after Christmas as well. But our major business is about being authoritative and trusted to people who need it. Whether it be here's a utility company where they basically, um, I'm sorry, I clicked too quickly, but they're billing those in green and it's those in red that they're not actually billing, so they're getting free utilities. And here's Northumbrian Water clearly saying, well, for we saved a million pounds in year one by just doing that analysis by just overlaying their data with Ordnance Survey data and being able to see the places they were supplying and not billing. Another thing that we often find is, for instance, um, in crises, Ordnance Survey information is used all the time to make sure that people have adequate supply of water um, and by using uh, the authoritative data, Anglian Water is saying they've made savings of over 90% on their original manual processes by being able to know where to locate their bowsers effectively, where to maintain those bowsers as well. And quite re in recent times, about 15 months ago, the government decided that all of the public sector should come under one agreement. We used to have seven agreements with uh, different parts of the public sector, from the NHS to the police and everything. And I was asked to try and streamline this. And what's been fantastic was we also were asked to allow lots of new members in. And now there are over two and a half thousand members, whereas there used to be every local authority was a member, but um, not every NHS. And certainly we didn't used to license our data to parish and community councils. And here you can say, see 1,559 of them 15 months later are using our data to make decisions in their GISs, etc. 
In fact, in my own local community, there was something in the parish magazine that says, does anyone know anyone who knows how to operate a GIS? So it's all right, I directed them to somebody. <laughs> I did know somebody, I just didn't admit I did too. Okay, I thought, thought I wouldn't be the most reliable person for the parish council. Anyway, the one Scotland mapping agreement, we have a similar agreement in Scotland as well. And just to sort of understand a few ways this is used, here is a council. There isn't a single waste truck in Great Britain that does not move using Ordnance Survey data, I'm delighted to tell you. And here is in Daventry. They're basically saying they can cut the costs of, of, uh, of managing waste um, by uh, reducing their diesel cost by 12%. Increasing spare capacity by 14% and eliminating overtime costs. In Cardiff, I've been using our data looking at how to basically have enhanced routing and vehicle management for people with special educational needs to make sure that they're actually improving the service for the people who have those needs but also optimising their vehicles, making sure that they are actually getting huge savings and they claim it's more than 1.3 million pounds. The Welsh Government, for instance, is, is collecting more than half a million pounds of, addif of additional revenue. Now, some of you may not like this, but that's just how it is, okay? Um, by looking at understanding place better, being able to link it better to make sure they understand what's actually going on in a particular place and making sure they're detecting avoidance very quickly. They're also making sure that the customer experience is better. When you go onto websites, for instance, um, so often people have found ineffective use of the data. Now, because of the public sector mapping agreement, they're able to use any products they choose for on their website and finding that's more effective for helping citizens. And South Wales Fire and Rescue, I can remember coming to actually see exactly how they were managing this. And it was one of the most fantastic examples of early use of analytical data and geographical information, where they were making sure they were using um, the data in the cab, as well as then mapping the 3D of buildings so they understood what they were going to meet when they got to the, the particular fire. So that was very helpful. And even, I was uh, very surprised, I only came across this example a few days ago, where Hull City is using it for cutting teenage pregnancy rates. And uh, it's all about working out uh, with demographics how best to um, make sure that they are targeting effectively their strategies in the right way. We also run a service 24 hours a day, seven days a week for mapping emergencies. It's important. I don't tend to talk too much about these because so often they are maybe things that are involving the police or whatever. But um, here is one that was quite public, is uh, Carlisle. And um, where was their whole, whole emergency management team? They were in the basement of that building. They didn't have any mapping left to do, so we came in. And another thing we're doing is making sure that people can get our data, even if they don't want the huge costs. Well, costs, are, when I mean costs, I mean the huge difficulty of managing huge data sets. There's lots of people who just want to use data and they're worried about, they don't have a GIS expert and they don't have other people who they can call upon. So here is South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue. And what they do is we host their data for them on top of Master Map. And within milliseconds, they're on their mobile devices getting our data from us. We've been doing a lot about making sure there's innovation going on because somebody has to invest in this industry and we want to make sure that lots of people, whatever age, feel they're able to access geographical information. So we used to get tons of letters from people who ran genealogy websites for their families, who said, I would love to have your data. Well, now there's a free service, which is used by scout groups, by anyone you can think of, clubs, individuals, 
to within five clicks, and it's very, very simple, uh, you're able to embed our data free of charge into your website using the open space application. And it's being used by uh, planning authorities and other things. Another thing we've done is try and work. We get a lot of approaches from people who say, I want to start a business, but I don't know how to. And we've got over 500 partners, and we decided the best thing was to try and make it much less scary by running something called Geovation. And Geovation is about saying, do you have a good idea? And if you have a good idea, we'll put you together with developers and people who might fund it and see if it's a, really a good idea. And so we've done a lot of these challenges, things like how can Britain feed itself better? And what's been fabulous is seeing that um, a lot of companies have got innovation funds. And they don't, they're finding them difficult to spend. So I help them spend them um, by being a very clear arbiter that we're not involved, but it's about geography. And one of the geovation challenges for 2012 was actually here in Wales. It was how can we connect communities and visitors along the Welsh coast path? And um, what happened was it was a collaborative challenge supported by all of those uh, organisations. And um, the key thing was finding out what was the problems people thought. And they, these guys from Ordnance Survey come along, they're very relaxed, I can assure you, and they, talk, they have things called powwows. And uh, hundreds of people came along, which was quite interesting. And they got 178 problems uh, out. They then held a geovation camp, which is where you get together all of the developers who could develop things with you. And eventually there was a showcase of which there ended up with eight finalists and a judging panel, which includes some of the greatest people in Europe um, in the kind of Wired magazine and that kind of slightly more innovative things. And the good thing was there was £126,000 to allow people to start their businesses, to give them their started funds. And um, we were delighted. There's uh, one of the winners was the Perfect Visitor Companion, another one was Food Finder, another was Living Paths, another one was Growing Roots. And what we do is we keep in touch with them and see how their businesses are going. But, you know, it doesn't stop anybody getting involved. Because many of you will know that our business model changed where a third of our assets are free to use now. And uh, then you pay for them after then. And they all start with the basic data, the address, the route, map, networks, terrain models, or topographic mapping. And you then can move further up. And if you move further up above the blue line, you pay, basically, because somebody has to pay for ordinance survey. And so there's a lot of data. This is all the data that's freely available and free for you to develop businesses on, free for you to do anything you like with it, really. And um, we see thousands of people per week doing that. And we also hold masterclasses. So just to finish, I'd like to tell you something I'm really, really, really proud about and we kept really, really, really quiet about. Um, for the last five and a half years, I've had one little worry in the back of my head every day, and I have to say it's been every day, would we have done what people really needed? Because in 2007, I was appointed to be the geospatial lead for uh, the Olympic Games. And uh, so what did that mean? I hadn't got a clue either. Um, anyway, the key thing was about identifying the number of agencies that really needed this data, really needed special data for, to run the Olympics. But you can imagine, 2007, most people didn't know what they needed. So we had lots of discussions, which certainly crystallized the nearer the games got. And what was amazing was 42 organizations eventually realized they needed that information. But they didn't need what was standard to Ordnance Survey, which was above the line. They needed a whole lot of things below the line. They basically wanted to make sure that Olympic Park, every change on it was mapped. Because wouldn't it have been terrible if a terrorist had come? That every utility, we knew where things were. They wanted to make sure for the first time that all street furniture was captured 
Well, Ordnance Survey doesn't capture street furniture. They wanted us to use high resolution, five to centi 10 centimeter, ortho rectified color aerial imagery and have it available at all times. So we went into a program of doing special information provision and we are told that it did save millions by just one organization doing it to the specifications everyone else needed. The first thing was we worked collaboratively together to define the data collection extents. And for instance, a good example was that it was decided that we needed to have incredibly wonderful, rich geography, better than ever before, in a, an area of 30 square kilometers around Olympic Park and 10 square kilometers around everything else, Weymouth, you know, or all of the other places we got to love over the summer. So basically we were flying a lot. This is a, a very small snapshot of the amount of change. And what um, was interesting is uh, we did capture some really funny things while we were uh, uh, getting five centimeter imagery. This was on a um, September, a Sunday in September. And there is just been put in the hammer and shot put center. And guess what? There's a man living the dream and he was a construction <laughs> worker. Anyway, basically here you could see something that all became something wonderful for us all. The opening ceremony that we all saw on the 28th of July. We had captured some of it by accident and had to keep rather quiet on the 30th of June. Um, what we had to do was update master map to the same extent all the way through, making sure all the new assets were mapped as soon as they were available to ensure that the data was there for whatever needs might be needed by people. But one of the things that I think I'm most proud of is this job. Basically, look at that junction and you probably think, oh, well, it's a junction, that's fine. What you won't realize is the level of detail, the trees, the lampposts, the drains, the water meter covers. When you next walk along the street and see a water meter cover, you will realize Ordnance Survey went and ground truthed every single one of them at the request around the Olympic site. And what we did was make sure that that data was available as people required it, giving you a new master map, one we will never probably create again, but telling you where there are drains, where there are lampposts and where there are everything, because they need to be sealed. And the costs of not knowing where they are could be traumatic. And in past times, they used to be collected by different agencies. You know, if the Queen comes, you'll find these things happen around a small geography. But think of the tens of thousands of important VIPs London was hosting. We also did it at all the other venues as well. The third dimension was created for the first time. And we also made sure there was complete synchronization with all our products at all times. One of the things that um, we uh, kept very quiet about, but we were highly involved in the creation of the Olympic Route Network, which obviously had its controversy, but I wasn't involved in the controversy, I just do the geography. And the turn-by-turn -turn restriction. And then, of course, all of a sudden, we heard the taxi drivers, they wanted to go on strike. So you have to look at what's the impact of that. And then, of course, the Prime Minister made a wonderful uh, pledge that everyone could see the torch within an hour of their home. Of course, uh, that requires somebody to know where the houses are and where the geography is, and then work out the route. So basically, we did that using the TOID in the Integrated Transport Network layer. And the other thing we did was create what was required for different agencies for them to be able to express uh, their work throughout their whole time, working together. And some of you will recognize some of these things because you got handed them. And they were from us uh, working collaboratively with our partners throughout the whole of the Olympics. And then uh, just to finish, we did something we've never done before, which was to mobilize ourselves for 66 days, 24 hours a day with very significant people um, making sure that whenever a map was required, a map was there. 
and uh, it's something that uh, you know I'm obviously everybody uh, in the whole country should be proud of the Olympics but it's also wonderful to have seen my organization do such a fantastic job for the Olympics so I hope over the last 45 minutes it's given you a kind of understanding of how I believe mapping um, underpins the world's decision making and bringing it back to why we're here tonight um, very much to honour the memory of Mike I just wanted to mention something that um, I spoke to Paul Curran a couple of nights ago who uh, was my tutor when I was 22 I think and also Mike's tutor and I think he summed it up for me when he said Vanessa the thing about Mike you was such a genuinely nice person who had the total respect and trust of all his colleagues. Thank you. I know Vanessa said she'd answer questions, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you. Um, that was a totally fascinating lecture incredibly wide-ranging. I kept scribbling down notes of things that I should remind you of at the end and say thank you for, but it's too long, <laughs> <laughs> so I won't, and it's getting quite late. But I just wanted to say that Mike would have been absolutely fascinated by that lecture. He loved gadgets and little computers and whizzy gigs and all of those things, and there were plenty of those for us to see. So thank you very much, and if you are prepared to answer yes, questions, course. that would be... Yes, of course, I'm very happy um, to. Has anyone got On anything. questions? Some people into silence, but very happy to answer. Uh, so this mapping of the Olympic Park is absolutely fascinating. I've never seen anything quite like that before. Can I get hold of that for teaching purposes, please? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I don't think you can. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, you can get hold of virtually everything from Ordnance Survey now, um, particularly because universities can get hold of it. But uh, the special products were made for 42 organisations and um, there was uh, some, uh, not legislation because that takes too long, but there were some special agreements made um, that it was only released to them. And uh, it was released to a couple of other governments at the request of the British government but it's not available. But Olympic Park mapping, you know, is of course available and will be put into Digimap and things like that. But something else, if by any chance you're ever down in London and you want to do something that's free of charge, um, Boris Johnson got a bit over keen at one point on what we were doing and he decided, um, and he's quite, he's a fascinating guy to work with, because, um, you know, you think he's kind of completely mad professor-like. I'll tell you, he's one of the most thoughtful and well-put-together people until a camera arrives. And then he's a bit Monty Python-like. But he, he thought what we were doing was pretty, pretty cool, I think. Um, and so he decided that the floor of the um, public area, when you go into the uh, assembly building, which is open to everybody, should be... Uh, basically an image map created by Ordnance Survey of the whole of London and it is absolutely fantastic and he and I went for a walk around it about two weeks ago with the people who had actually made it for him because everyone was so busy before the Olympics nobody had time to do anything and um, he used it because they changed they stopped calling it the you know the London whatever it's called at the moment but it became uh, a VIP centre where they bought people who wanted to invest into London and so people were able to walk over Red Bridge and see Wimbledon and things like this and it's really fascinating so if you've ever got people down in London but it's free to walk in you know there's no problem you just say you want to see the map so I understand yeah so it's a thing to do any other questions Mm. 
well, just to set the record straight, Ordnance Survey is not collaborating with China, but uh, <laughs> um, yes, but the, the the UN, of course, China's a very major um, a, a major colleague within the United Nations. Um, basically, at the moment, the key thing is to help countries where there is such inadequate mapping. If we think of our colleagues in Burma, they have not a single computer in their national mapping. If you think of our colleagues in Mongolia, they are moving forward, but they still are a very long way from having a good mapping base. And throughout Africa, that is also um, an ever-emerging problem. And so, um, obviously, kind of fast forward to Britain, and, you know, it's very, very interesting. I think there still has to be a debate. Um, you know, Ordnance Survey's role is never to do anything. We don't do anything with people. We just do mapping. But then how people use, you know, let's take uh, Google Maps, which is on many of our, of our iPhones, and understand what's happening with location. That debate has not been really had in this country. It has been had in certain countries, but not in Britain. So it's kind of quite interesting on how that information is used. But equally, um, it can be massively helpful. Um, Map Action, which I'm a patron of, they did a lot of mapping of mobile phone signals to get people out in Haiti and saved real lives. So, you know, these things always have pros and cons, don't they? It's like, you know, we all like having a car, but then it causes problems to the environment. You know, it's a sort of pros and cons every way you look. But uh, we all know that we have the ability to turn off the location devices on our iPhones if we want. But we also quite like it when, you know, we're in an unfamiliar city just to see the dot move as we move and say, ah, oh, I must be there nearly soon, you know. So these are the issues. But um, I'm sure there will be big debates at some point. But, you know, Ordnance Survey is just a supply of the geography, nothing more than that. We don't get involved in people. I'm well, very clear we don't. Any other points? Well, shall we? In that case, can we uh, thank Vanessa again very much for a really interesting and very varied talk. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.